Today, I'm very, very excited because we're going to have a one-on-one with one of the most interesting, insightful, and influential individuals in the broader world of crypto. And I promise you, it's going to be very exciting, insightful, interesting chat because, as we just mentioned, today we have Sam Backman fried the founder and, and CEO of FTX, one of the leading crypto exchanges in the world. By the way, one thing you may not know about Sam is that he's vegan and he sleeps four hours a night. And actually, university, he did a degree in physics and mathematics at MIT. So here you go, Sam. Good to have you with us at the AFF today. Thanks for having me. So, Sam, as we kick off today, there's a number of topics that we want to touch upon. Uh, one of them, obviously, is your views on the impact that crypto will have on the future of financial services and the future of finance, but also on the impact it can have from a social impact perspective. And of course, I know a topic that is very close to your heart is really how it can help from an altruism perspective, especially from an effective altruism uh, perspective as well. Uh, but as, as we kick off, uh, Sam, today, uh, obviously, we have at the AFF a lot of CEOs listening, a lot of central banks listening, a lot of people in, in leadership teams at financial institutions. From your perspective, what is the one, let's say, biggest mistake you've seen financial institutions make when it comes to crypto? And what do you think could be the catalyst for that to change over the coming months and years? So I think, and I, I want to say this with as much respect as I can have for all of the factors that I know are, are pressing in a lot of different directions um, on, on you know, a lot of players in the you know, finance and fintech space. Um, my sense is that uh, you know, a lot of institutions right now are sort of dancing around crypto. You know, they would like to get involved, uh, but it's going to be a process. You know, there, there are a lot of steps that they're going to have to get through to get their stakeholders on board um, from regulatory and other perspective. You know, I, I think a big thing I'd say is I think there's a real opening for a for you know a highly regulated um, you know a traditional stakeholder and institution to jump into crypto and actually play a really leading role in it. I think very few are are taking the first step, and I think that there are absolutely massive wins that you can do uh, that they can have from doing so. Um, and so I think maybe that's just where I'd start is like you know, totally understand the reasons to be hesitant and to be cautious, especially from a regulatory perspective. But I do think there are real wins um, from being willing to move faster than a lot of the other players are. But, you know, some obviously the crypto industry moves massively faster than traditional finance, right? And obviously we often talk about, when we talk about crypto m a about like banks coming, traditional financial institutions coming and crying crypto firms. But actually, one thing that we may see is actually the opposite. A lot of the crypto firms come and actually try to get into traditional finance. And I know you joked in the past about FTX can go acquire some of the traditional banks. Do you think that's something we could see that if the banks don't move fast enough, we may see the crypto firms come and actually get into that space? You know, there's a chance of it. And uh, I think that, you know, I would certainly be cautious about exactly how far to go in predicting that. Um, But you're starting to see little bits of it already. You're starting to see. Um, you know, I mean, we saw a few uh, U.S. financial uh, futures exchanges and firms get acquired by crypto companies over the last year. I think you're probably going to see more of that. Um, and uh, and I think one of the really powerful things that that's going on here is that crypto exchanges have built full stack products. Um, you know, everything from you know the the end user, the mobile app and experience, the back end liquidity and and infrastructure the compliance and everything in between, I think that that makes them potentially really profitable businesses. I also think it makes them businesses that can uh, potentially subsume uh, other ones. And, and, and I do think that we've started to see that play out in some cases already. And when you talk about, let's say there's obviously the financial institutions, but also a lot of the investors, and obviously there's a lot of these large investors who are at AFF with us uh, today. I mean, obviously you guys were very successful recently at raising a $400 million plus uh, round, valuing the business at 25 uh, bucks, at uh, 25 yards. And obviously you got a lot of big names uh, reportedly in the media that were also in your round from OTPP and Temasek to Sequoia and BlackRock and many others. When you were having this discussion with these institutional players, and talking to them about not only FTX, but of course, the crypto industry. What is the biggest uh, misconception or you think one of the areas where you were the most surprised where there was not as much knowledge as you would expect? I mean, you know, I think to some extent, uh, we, we, we've done a lot of 
thinking and talking with players before this. And so we had a decent sense of where they were going to be coming from. Um, but I, I think that, you know, one of these is, is I, I just like, where is the business model in crypto and how does it differ from traditional business models? I think that's something a lot of players haven't thought about much. Um, and they haven't reflected on the fact that like, for some reason in crypto, the exchanges seem to play a really central role. Whereas in the rest of the financial ecosystem, you know, they play a relevant role. It's not like they have, you know, nothing to do with what's going on, but it is a much less central one. Um, and I think that actually really ends up pointing to something pretty profound about the difference between the crypto ecosystem and the traditional financial ecosystem that people haven't, uh, you know, haven't really fully uh, contended with. And, um, and, and so I think that sort of is one big thing that, uh, that we saw, you know, really changed people's minds about the ecosystem as they walked through it for the first time. And obviously, I think it's a, you make a very interesting point on the very important role that a centralized exchanges play in the crypto space, which is, doesn't come naturally if you know, somebody's not familiar with our, with our yep. ecosystem. What do you think of, let's say, uh, obviously, one of the big topics right now is the whole role of decentralized finance, DeFi. We went from about $20 uh, billion at the beginning of last year uh, to around $100 billion at the time we're recording this today. I mean, what's your view on the impact that DeFi, especially DEXs, decentralized exchanges, could have on, on the future of centralized exchanges? So I think that they're, you know, probably eventually going to be applying some pressure there on centralized exchanges. Um, and, and, and I think that they, uh, you know, there's a pretty good chance that they will play a really significant role um, in what the uh, you know, future of the financial ecosystem looks like. I do think that people sometimes overstate that role to some extent, that people will sometimes frame that as, um, you know, sort of eating the whole rest of the financial ecosystem or, or something like that. And, you know, I don't want to confidently say that won't happen, but that's not my best guess. Um, you know, my best guess is that they will play an important role, but that a lot of things will remain on centralized venues. And, and I think that among any, other things, anything that is really computationally intensive is going to have a really hard time fitting on a decentralized exchange because, you know, fundamentally you have thousands of validators, millions of validators computing everything that's happening on, 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 a, on a decentralized blockchain. And that's, that's not free, uh, you know, and, and so anything that is, really, uh, really complex um, from computational perspective, sort of doesn't make sense to end up um, on a DEX. Uh, but, it, but I think that, you know, this sort of like Robin Hood type experience absolutely could. Yeah, actually, you know, you're talking about the future of uh, finance. And obviously, one of the big topics as we're kicking off the year is really uh, the whole Web 3.0 movement, right? What's happening with the metaverse, the whole uh, uh, surge of NFTs, and of course, with DeFi in this whole Web 3.0 ecosystem. I mean, also, what's your view on the role that potential exchanges or centralized players could play, if any, in this Web 3.0 uh, future eco ecosystem or reality? Yeah, I think there are a lot of ways in which, you know, exchanges are natural backends for a lot of the technology that's going to be important there. And so, you know, if you think about it, what have we built out? Well, we've built out, I mean, a magic engine, but also deposits and withdrawals of cryptocurrencies and of NFTs, fiat deposits and withdrawals, compliance, licensing, customer onboarding. We built out every piece of this backend technology that is important. Um, for uh, for a surf that that wants to integrate with the metaverse, that wants to add NFTs or other surf Web three elements, and I, and so I expect a number of them will make use of the crypto companies that are doing that, and uh, and particularly the crypto exchanges. Uh, you know, we launched an NFT platform, and um, and I've been talking with a lot of partners about them using that as the back end for their uh, customers' NFT experience. It's interesting, obviously, and uh, all these are obviously reaching out a bigger audience than the pure crypto trading audience as well, uh, which is very, very interesting as well. Actually, on, on that perspective, you know, one of the interesting things, just Sam, watching you and how you run the business the last, uh, you know, one or two years is really even on the partnership side, you guys done a lot of deals with the sports world. Uh, for, for the Miami Heat now being called the FTX uh, uh, center to, to even uh, what you've done with Tom Brady, to what you've done with uh, Major League Baseball referees. How do you seeing when it comes to the next step of crypto and the, the world of crypto and sports coming together? Why do you think that's the case? And you think that's going to accelerate over the coming years? So, you know, I, I think the big thing that we've been thinking about is how do we build out our brand? How do we you know, make ourselves known? 
and, and and hopefully in a way that gives um you know potential counterparts and users of ours some sense of who we are in a way which is memorable and 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 so you know, we have done a lot working with sports brands on that um i think you know we're going to see that with us and, and and certainly with other people expanding beyond sports so i don't think that it's just going to be sports forever um but i but but i think that you know a lot of this is looking at like what are these gigantic global brands and presences that are really important and compelling to people um and that we can you know form partnerships with as opposed to thinking about like you know facebook ads or something like that as you know core customer acquisition tools yeah Interesting. And by the way, for our listeners today, if you have any questions you want to ask to Sam, uh, please uh, make sure to ask them, and I'll make sure to to actually uh, direct them uh, to Sam. I'll have the questions on the on the below of my screen here. Uh, Sam, I want to talk a couple of things about uh, obviously about social impact and also about about you personally as well. Uh, first of all, it's about social impact. Um, obviously, there's uh, crypto had a bad rep, especially in the early days. You know, obviously, it was often linked with uh, money laundering, criminal activity. And obviously, there's been a lot of these myths have been uh, demystified over the years. Um, do you think often there's obviously a big social impact role that crypto can have from financial education to even empowering people? What do you think, how big can the impact be from a social impact perspective, in your opinion, when it comes to crypto and the broader public and investing public, especially. Yeah, totally. So, you know, I, I think that one of the big goals of crypto is to be able to build, you know, really an ecosystem uh, where there's financial inclusivity, where anyone can get access um, and equitable access to financial markets. And when you look at, you know, traditional markets, you just don't see that. You know, when you look at what the median user of uh, you know, uh, stock exchange has. They're going through Robinhood, the mobile app that goes through some clearing firms, some PFOF firms, a dark pool, some more PFOF firms, some stock loan desks. You're going through 10 counterparties. By the time you get to the end, you can't, you don't have full access to order types. You're not even allowed to see the market data, right? Like you can't see the order book that you're sending an order because that's kind of fucked up. Um, and, and it's just like totally different systems that the you know most well connected and and largest players versus the, the common users have access to um and i think you know one of the most powerful things about crypto is that it's disintermediated and i think that has really profound implications on how the ecosystem develops but actually from that perspective do you see a future where for example people can get paid in crypto conduct other financial services in crypto and you know be able to actually benefit more uh, than actually going by some of the traditional intermediaries that we have today. I could absolutely see it. And, and you know, I, I don't want to claim confidently that it's definitely going to happen and, and going to happen tomorrow or anything like that. Um, but I think it, that I, that it could happen. I think it probably should happen in a lot of cases. And I think it would have profound impact on what, you know, what the financial system looked like, I think probably for the better, um, you know, giving the majority of users the same impact um, to financial tools that most people have just assumed uh, for for a very long time, and so that that's I think like what I'm most excited about um, from sort of the you know how it could reshape uh, the financial world. And you know, remittances are one piece of this that gets talked about a lot. You know, you think about how hard it is to send money overseas right now. Um, this could reform that because again, you have all these intermediaries that make it extremely difficult to actually send funds from point A to point B without getting a whole line of companies, each of whom is heavily incentivized to say no, to somehow all get together and say yes. So, so if you had one message for a lot of the CEOs of these intermediaries who are listening today, what would be that message to them? I think like, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I, I've sort of gone in a slightly di different direction business-wise. And, but, you know, I think what I'd say is, um, you know, try to integrate with the new world. Um, you know, try to see what you can do um, to work with this because I think it's really powerful and compelling. And, and I think especially a lot of these companies that have absolutely massive reach, massive user bases, and a lot of really valuable partnerships. Um, I do think they're exciting things that they can do to work with others. I don't think that they need to be completely left out, uh, you know, in, in the dark here. Yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting. I mean, as you know, for a lot of these traditional financial institutions, 
uh, working with crypto or even getting involved in crypto, having the agility to follow the the speed of our industry is not necessarily uh, easy. So it's going to be very, very interesting to yeah. watch uh, from, from that perspective. I mean, you know that space very well, especially, especially coming from the trading side as well. Sam, I, I want to focus on one thing. I know you're very, very passionate about it. It's really about the topic of uh, altruism, right? I know you, you, you spent actually, uh, I don't think many people know this, but after your time at Jane Street, uh, you spent some time really focusing on actually on on, uh, on effective altruism. Can you maybe share a, a bit for our audience, why are you so attracted about effective altruism? What does it mean for you? What does it attract you? Uh, and, and if you think the crypto industry has done enough giving back so far in our short decade of history? Yeah, so, you know, effective altruism is basically coming from the perspective of, all right, so you want to have positive impact on the world, you want to make it better. Um, with everything else, when we want to have positive impact, you know, when we think about having impact on the companies that, that we're working with, um, working for that, that we're running, you know, we think about, well, how, how do we maximize that? You know, like, well, what, what should we do um, to, uh, you know, move our company forward as much as possible. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, I think that for some reason, when people think about uh, about that with philanthropy and giving, often that turns into, well, how can I just make sure to have a bit of impact? You know, how, however much it is, just like, you know, some. And uh, I, I think that's like very different than if you approach it from, you know, the direction of how do we have as much impact as as possible. Um, and, you know, rather than just finding something that sounds good, it's, you know, how do you calculate or estimate or do the best you can with, you know, how many lives are you saving per dollar? Um, you know, what is the impact that you're having here? And what can you do to increase that? I, I, I think all that's like super, super important and something we just don't don't think about or talk about nearly enough. You know, with the recent COVID pandemic, do you think from an effective altruism perspective, how would it rate, let's say, the, the efforts that have been done globally on that perspective? Uh, really bad. Um, I, think, I think the one thing that everyone can agree on with COVID is that we f***ed it up. Like, I think everyone's on the same page about that, that we did a really bad job. Um, but I, I think that there's been shockingly little um, in terms of how we can do better next time. That's like, that's the opposite, like, uh, that's sort of the obvious direction to go in, right? Like, you know, everyone agrees that, like, this time didn't go so well. So, all right, what should we change? And, and I just think that from a lot of angles, the, the thinking on that's been really, really weak. Um, and uh, I think we'd probably mess it up again. Um, and that's pretty bad because not only was COVID pretty bad, but it could have been a lot worse. You know, the honest truth is that COVID was not the most deadly disease we've ever seen. Um, you could imagine something with the, you know, infection and, you know, spreading qualities of COVID, but the ultimate lethality of SARS. Um, and that would have been way worse for the world, you know, maybe 50 times worse. So we really better be better prepared. There are a lot of things we could do to be better prepared. I think it's an incredibly important area to be working on. I think it's not something that I feel confident we will be by default, given how li how few concrete steps we've taken towards addressing even just the fact that like it took us a year with COVID to get a vaccine out. And that was Operation Warp Speed is what it was called. That's the fastest we've ever done it. And it was a year of people dying. Very, very interesting. By, by the way, before I move on, there's a very other interesting question from the audience. Who's the kind of the benefactor or the uh, altruist you admire the most? you know, based on your views and based on what you've seen in the recent years? I mean, I think there are a lot of people who've done a lot of good. I think that amongst this sort of like, you know, old guard of, of foundations, I think the Gates Foundation has done a ton of great things, um, including, uh, you know, warning about what would happen if there were a really bad pandemic. I don't think we're prepared for that. And and starting to build out detection capabilities for that. Um, I, I think the, the one that I've been most excited about has been the open philanthropy uh, project, which uh, is a um, foundation um, uh, funded by Dustin Moskowitz and, and Carrie Tuna and others um, that has been doing a lot um, across a, a really wide range of areas uh, to try and have a ton of, of impact and uh, has been really impressive. Very interesting. Sam, I have a couple of questions coming in from the audience. I want to make sure that I can tackle yeah. them. 
we had one of them uh, saying, uh, Sam, if you could design the ideal crypto regulatory framework, what would that be? And what do you think the regulators are doing wrong now that they could do to really create a good regulatory system for crypto platforms? Totally. So, you know, first I'll say if you go to fpxpolicy.com, you can find some drafts of uh, policy frameworks that, that we sketched out. Um, I think the biggest things, you know, there are a few things to tackle here on stable coins, which has come up a lot. I think it's pretty straightforward what the right thing to do is just have a framework where you have attestations and audits um, that confirm that they are backed the way they say they are. There are some hairy things around the edges here, but if you just do that, that gives you 80% of the way there. That addresses the largest concerns that people have with stable coins without inhibiting their ability to help make payments better. Um, I think that when it comes to markets regulation, we already have markets regulatory frameworks for all other asset classes. It's the same thing with crypto um, and it can apply in, in pretty straightforward ways there. Um, I think that you really want a unified framework though for crypto. The thing I really would hate to see would be that futures spot, you know, futures on stable coins, spot and stable coins, futures on tokenized assets, tokenized stocks, spot tokenized stocks, um, that these all end up in different markets frameworks with different reporting requirements, different oversight, um, different clearing and custody. You can't cross margin them. And, and so I think that like just choosing one standard um, and saying, this is, you know, this is the, the, you know, same thing we're doing with, with whatever, with money, futures, securities, or choose one of them. That's what we're going to do with, you know, cryptocurrencies from a market standpoint. Um, and then from an issuance standpoint, which I think is another uh, big area here. Um, you know, I, I think what you probably want is a framework that tries to address the important things about uh, cryptocurrencies from a disclosure uh, perspective to prospective investors, things to prevent fraud and, and, and sort of false statements, things to accurately represent the supply of the asset and how that might change, to accurately represent whether it does or doesn't draw value from associated protocols or companies or other things. And, you know, rather than arguing about whether or not it's a security, I think often the right thing to say is, look, it's complicated. Um, you know, some of these have some security like properties, others have more, others have fewer. Let's try to come up with the disclosures which are important for investors to be able to make informed decisions. Yeah. Very interesting. Another question here, Sam, we have is uh, how many years do you think, how far are we from broader institutional adoption of crypto? Is it one year, three year, 10 years? If we had to ballpark, how far are we from a broader crypto institutional adoption? You know, I'd say three to five years. I think like each year we're going to see some progress on that front. It's not all going to come at once. This is a years long process for each institution to really get involved in the ecosystem. But I'd be really surprised if five years from now it had gotten really substantially further than it is today. I would also be really surprised if one year from now every major financial institution was heavily participating in the crypto ecosystem. You know, I think I think somewhere between those is where you're probably going to see the bulk of that movement. Uh, I, would, I would agree with you on that one as well, Sam. Another one, Sam, here is what do you think the impact of CBDCs could be on the future of, of decentralized currencies like Bitcoin and the broader crypto assets? So I think when people talk about CBDCs, there's really two different things you can mean. And often they're sort of conflated with each other. One of which is, is which is really more of just like the digital dollar, digital yuan, digital whatever, is a, you know, maybe blockchain-based system for a fiat currency, but a closed network, one where you know only some select set of banks are allowed to have direct access to this network. And, and so it's basically just digitizing the existing fiat system, um, but it's not an open network. You can't have the sort of you know user participation or direct access that you see in cryptocurrencies. It doesn't disintermediate. Um, I think it could be really valuable just in terms of making things more efficient, but it's not a substitution or a replacement for, for, for public cryptocurrencies. The other thing you could see would be something more like the current stable coins, where it's an open permissionless network that is backed by a fiat currency. And in that case, I think it's in some sense a direct competitor to current public stable coins that we see um, and might get huge amounts of adoption in DeFi and other places. Sam, before we move on to the fire a rapid round of question, let me last one. Do you think there, there'll, there's a way that we will be able to put KYC AML on DeFi? Yeah, I, there is. Um, so uh, there are a lot of ways to implement this, but I'll give you one example. Take some centralized party that KYC's users, FTX is one example, right? Um, you can imagine FTX writing out to the blockchain in one format or another information pertaining to the KYC status of 
various addresses associated with users of the platform. And, and there are a lot of different ways you could encode that, that you could encrypt it. Um, you know, you probably want to give a lot of flexibility and, and choice to the users about what they do or don't want there um, to make sure that you're not, you know, representing publicly any more information than they want you to. Um, but once you have that, you now have an on-chain signal about KYC that a DeFi protocol could uh, could automatically read and parse as part of its uh, normal running. Great, great example how actually the centralized platforms could play a role with DeFi, actually. So very well said. Sam, we're going to end up, really, we have about less than three minutes left. The bell is back. So we're going to do a rapid round of questions. I'm going to ask you quick questions. I need a quick answer, one or two word answers, and we're going to take it from there. Are you ready, Sam? All right. Excellent. Uh, let's kick it off. What is Sam? What is the biggest challenge you've had as an entrepreneur that you didn't expect before you launched FTX? I I would say figuring out how to manage a team when things get uh, messy or bad. Here we go, Sam. What is the other crypto CEO? If you can choose one other crypto CEO that you admire a lot, who is that person? I I mean I'll I'll say uh, Anatoly, the CEO of uh, Solana, is a really brilliant and and sweet guy. Here we go. Sam, tomorrow you could set up a new crypto firm and you can choose one of these four co-founders. Who would you pick? Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Warren Buffett, or Kim Kardashian? Oh, boy. Uh, um, uh, Elon Musk. I mean, the biggest celebrity and also uh, great at working. <laughs> Sam, if you're not in the crypto industry, what industry would you be in? Uh, I think... Uh, I mean, trading, probably quant trading is where I was before. And if not, maybe biotech. Biotech, that's interesting. There you go. Um, Sam, what do you do on your weekends or when you're not working? I know you work all the time, but when you're not working, what's your favorite thing to do? Uh, in the background, I'll often play video games or watch Netflix or uh, sports, uh, often while working. <laughs> Watch you bring my next question. What's your favorite video game? I currently have been playing a lot of storybook brawl before that uh, League of Legends. Of course. Here we go. Sam, your favorite Netflix series. If there's one series on Netflix you recommend people to watch. I, I, Bojack Horseman. Oh, wow. Here we go. Yeah. Very, very in interesting. Sam, uh, you studied, obviously, like I mentioned at the beginning, you studied uh, uh, physics and math at, at MIT. If you could go back to university today, what topic would you study? Any, any different topic you would study? I would drop out and start a crypto exchange. To all the young people listening, here we go. Wise piece <laughs> of advice from uh, from Sam. Uh, Sam, I heard from Ryan on a tweet yesterday that uh, now you drive a Toyota. Is that is that is that true? Yes. Here we go. Um, and uh, another question uh, before we finish, uh, Sam. I uh, you're obviously a vegan. What's your favorite vegan dish? That I recommend people to people. I, I eat a lot of Beyond Burgers. <laughs> And last question, Sam. Uh, thanks again for being with us at AFF here in 2022. Sam, if you could have lunch with one person, lunch with one person dead or alive, lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, who would that be? I'm going to cheat here and say uh, President Biden because I think he could be really productive for crypto frameworks for the U.S. <laughs> You know, very practical there. Sam, thank you very much for being with us today on AFF. It was great to have you on board uh, and continue with all the great work you're doing, not only on crypto, but also on giving back and all the altruism side as well. Thank you.